Amen. Philippians 2.14, do everything without murmurings and disputings. George had it all. Not George Benson, but George had it all. He was a successful businessman. Matter of fact, he was independently wealthy, drove the finest automobiles, had a luxurious lifestyle, and yet he felt empty inside. Sounds familiar. Well, one day, George totally surprised everybody and, uh, and left everything to become a monk in a monastery. Interesting. On the day George arrived at the monastery, the head monk told him uh, he would have to take the customary vow of silence, and George would not be allowed to say anything for one year. But on one, the one-year anniversary, every year after that, he got to say two words. Okay? He was allowed two words. How many of y'all have heard this before? Go along with me. It's still funny. All right. Anyway, so on the first anniversary, the head monk said, what are your two words? And he said, room dark. Well, at the end of the second year, the head monk says, do you have two words you'd like to say? No, George said, bed hard. Well, the third year came by, and the, and, the, and the monk almost was hesitant to ask him. He says, do you have two words you want to say? He said, food lousy. Well, at the end of the fourth year, George didn't even wait. He went charging into the office, looked at the head monk, and said, going home. And the head monk says, well, I'm, that's no great surprise. All you've done since you've been here is complain. <laughs> complain. Complaining. What are the causes of a complaining heart? What are some of the causes? Well, it's a symptom of a number of spiritual problems. First of all, complaining is often caused by unbelief. Unbelief. Go back, if you would, please, to the book of Exodus. Don't go there, but think back with me in the book of Exodus all the way through the book of Numbers. It talks about the Israelites. The Israelites are probably one of the most prime examples of all the complainers you could ever imagine. And they did not believe that God could or would adequately supply their need. Complaining is a lack of faith in the goodness of God. Complaining is a lack of faith in the goodness of God. Amazingly, it was the lack of faith in the power of God as well. I, wanna, I want you to think about this. They thought that, that, that their God led them to a place where He could not care for them. I want you to think about this. After the ten plagues took place, and they miraculously left Egypt with all of Egypt's wealth, by the way, got to the Red Sea, Red Sea parted, dry ground walking across, some almost two million people with all their stuff, <laughs> and all Egypt's stuff, get on the other side, God defeats the enemy, and now they're stopping to say, listen, I don't think you're going to be able to take care of us out here, God. The Israelites thought they were being led to the desert to die. And what kind of a God would do that? Unbelief is a serious sin against the very character of God. Did you know that? Unbelief is a sin against the character of God. How many times do they have to see God work on their behalf before they would finally believe in Him? And doesn't the same go for you and I? How many times do we have to see God work in our lives, in our workplace, in our church, before we believe what God said He's going to do, He's going to do? And the next time you, you complain, stop and remember, you are probably expressing unbelief in the goodness of God or in the ability of God to take care of you or whatever situation you're complaining about. Hang on. It's going to get good. What else? Well, one of the second causes of a complaining heart is self-centeredness. Uppermost in the minds of the Israelites was not how to please God. But what? What shall we eat? What shall we eat? What are we going to drink? All they could think about was their needs right there, right then, not being met. They didn't get it when they wanted it, and so now they were going to complain about it. 
All they could think about was themselves and their complaints were clearly caused by self-centeredness. Israel was being self-centered, but God wanted them to focus on His glory. In Exodus 16, 7, Moses said, In the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. And they need to get their eyes off themselves and, and instead focus on the glory of their great God. They need to contemplate the glory of His greatness. Instead, we question Him at every move. Contemplate His power. It is not important that we're comfortable in life. What is important is that God is glorified. All around us, ever-present temptation to cause ourselves to be the center of the universe. Everywhere you look, people are saying, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. It is not about you, it is about Him. It is not about me, it is about Him. It is not about the President or the Pope or anybody else. It is about God and God alone and His glory. What we see on TV in particular trains us to think that our perceived needs are to be met as quickly as possible. We're told that we have the right to these things. We feel that if we can obtain more of the material things in life, we're finally going to be happy. I want to ask you, how many of you have obtained all the things in life that you want? When your kids ask you even what you want for your birthday, you can't think of anything because you have everything. And yet we still complain. We complain when we fall short of our expectations. But in contrast, over in Matthew 6, 31-33, Jesus says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. For all these things the Gentiles sing, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all those things. But He says this, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. The next time you complain, think about the fact you're probably being like a self-centered child. Brother Don, I don't like this preaching. How do you think I felt when I tried to put the message together? God had to deal with my heart before He dealt with anybody else's. What's another reasoning for complaining? Pride. Pride. When we complain against the Lord and ask Him why bad things happen to us, we're assuming a superior posture and giving the impression that we're in charge and God is actually accountable to us. Think about that for a minute. We question God at every turn. And we think that He is beholden to us. How prideful is it when we complain and question God's dealings with us? If you continue to look further down in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, uh, in the last part of verse 7, it says, They tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? They put the Lord on the spot. And they were demanding He give them water right here, right now. So as you go through your own experience of deprivation and disappointment, don't let unbelief and self-centeredness and pride cause you to complain against the Lord Himself or the leaders of your workplace or the leaders of your church. Do everything. Do everything without complaining and argument. Have you complained about anything this past week? What about the guy that cut you off in traffic? Or what about the drive through taking 45 seconds instead of 30 seconds? Anybody remember when drive throughs first came about? You ordered at the window and you had to sit and wait while they cooked the food and brought it, out and brought it to the window. Anybody remember that? And how we complain. What have, have, how many of us have had a complaint-free week? Isn't that interesting? Friends, we've come up with some cute little sayings to justify our complaining. You know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. No, it just means that they put grease on you to shut you up because you won't stop complaining. Or the, the crying baby is the one that gets the milk. 
right? That's right, because you can't bound and gag a baby. Amen? Now, when your children are a little older, you can put a little sock in their mouth and make them learn a lesson. Anybody ever taken a trip with a chronic complainer? Oh, after about the first hour, aren't you smacking your head against something solid saying, What in the world have I done? Why did I invite this person to come along? Why did I ever expect them to be any different? You ever sat beside a chronic complainer at a ball game? Or in a restaurant? Oh my gosh! I want to, can I tell you something? People make mistakes, okay? And yes, people make constant mistakes sometimes, but is that really a reason to get self-righteous and go off in the middle of a restaurant and show yourself? Or at a ball game? You ever watch people at a ball game? <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, I've complained against the officials, but only when I'm right and they're wrong, right? <laughs> But the thing about it is, you see them in a ball game. There's people that will come down out of the stands and beat up a rump. A rump. Ump. I was trying to say umpire and referee at the same time. They'll beat up a rump too. And when I find one, I'll show you them doing that. Hey, serious message. All right, here we go. How about this? Have you ever gone to church with a chronic complainer? There are preachers that I have known that have left churches and some have even left the ministry because they grow weary of dealing with chronic complaining. As a pastor, I was told about, and the reason I remember his name is the same as my son. His name's Ben. It's Pastor Ben, and uh, he was preaching out at a church, and this one guy, they called him, his name was Charlie, so if your name's Charlie, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean you, unless the shoe fits. But anyway, his name was Complaining Charlie. And every time, he would have everything nitpicky to say. You did this wrong, you did that wrong, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right, that's not right. Well, the pastor thought, you know what, I preached a great sermon today. And for pastor to say that, that's a pretty big deal, right? Well, here comes old complaining Charlie after a whole line of folks, you know, that kind of say, and I guess he thought he was the one to keep the preacher humble, right? Like, God can't do that. So anyway, complaining Charlie comes up and started nitpicking about the service again. About that time, Pastor Ben handed him a piece of paper. Complaining Charlie looked and he said, what is this? He said, that's a list of churches I think you'll be more happy at. <laughs> True story. The man left, never came back, and the church grew from that point on. Friends, we may pass off complaining as a harmless, annoying habit, but God takes complaining much more seriously. In the eyes of God, complaining is a sin. In the Old Testament, the classic example, as I've mentioned before, if you'll turn to Numbers chapter 11, just hold your place there for just a few minutes. Numbers chapter 11, I want to give you a little background. They were 400 years in captivity. They, the longer they stayed in Egypt, the more difficult life began to, to be for them. They began crying for God to send them a deliverer, and God heard their voice and sent Moses, and he, and he led God's people out of Egypt, and He promised them the promised land. You would think if people were promised a promised land from God, it would click that He was going to supply their needs from here to here and everywhere in between. It's not like they're going to throw your dead body over the promised land and say, look, I kept my promise. <laughs> Their celebration quickly turned to complaining. And in Numbers 11, there's four valuable truths that we want to learn today. And I want to show you those four truths. Number one, complaining is a condemned sin. Complaining is a condemned sin. Look at verses 1 through 3. Here we go. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. And the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. 
And he called the name of the place Tiberah because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. God hates complaining. Hey, let's all say that, shall we? God hates complaining. Uh, a little bit better. Come on, let's do better. God hates complaining. Do you believe that? You should. He does not enjoy listening to somebody whine and complain any more than you or I. In verse 1, when God heard the people complaining, His anger was aroused. And I want you to see a valuable truth that is in that verse. God always hears your complaints. There is not a one that He does not hear. So the next time you're sitting at the stoplight and you're complaining how long it takes to turn green, remember God hears you. Teenager, the next time you start complaining about how bad your life is at home, you better believe God hears you. Adults, the next time you mutter something under your breath about how you hate your job, God hears you. Are you listening? The next time you blow off to somebody about what's wrong with your church, God hears you. Verse 1 tells us that when God heard these, uh, this Israel, these Israelites complain, He sent down fire, burned up the outskirts of the Israeli camp. Now, I don't know about you, but if God sent down fire from heaven every time I complained, it would take me no time at all to stop complaining. How about you? No time at all. Let's not this. Uh, meatloaf again? We just had meatloaf last week. <laughs> okay. Right? Of all the weekends for it to rain, why did it have to rain this weekend? I was supposed to go to the beach. <laughs> cool. How about that? I didn't like the preacher's sermon this morning. For one thing, it was too long, and for another thing, he stepped on my toes. I'd throw that in. Right? But there's a valuable truth in all seriousness. Complaining is a condemned sin. Here's the second truth, number two. Complaining is a counterproductive sin. Look at verse 4, and we'll go through verse 6. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again. In other words, complained, whining, okay? Uh, and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, and the cucumbers, and the melons, and the leeks, and the onions, and the garlic. I'm so hungry. But now our soul is dried away. There's nothing at all besides this manna before us. Let's get the picture here. The Israelites are out in the middle of the Sinai Desert, a land that is so barren, so dry, and so scarce. Nothing could live out there. But God is providing the way for all these people to live and to, and to flourish. God has graciously supplied their physical needs, and He gave them this daily supply of a sweet honey wafer-like substance called manna. Now, from everything I've studied about manna, scientists and nutritionists would deem it a miracle food if it were available to you and me today. You see what I mean? Because in that little simple food of manna, it provided all the vitamins and nutrients that the body needed to not only be, not only to be sustained, but to be healthy and strong as well. Interesting. But rather than play, praising God for the food He provided, they complain about the foods they didn't have. Kind of like many of us do when we stand in front of an open kitchen cabinet or an open refrigerator and complain about not having anything to eat when everything is packed to the, to the gills. You know when we say that? It just means we don't want to fix it. Right? There's nothing easy to eat. No junk food. So rather than being grateful for the manna, they started craving the foods they'd eaten while they were in Egyptian captivity. The fish, the garlic, and the leeks. Oh! was so great. But I want to tell you, these are probably the same people who the day they left Egypt probably said, Whoo, I hope I don't ever have to eat another Egyptian cucumber or another Egyptian onion again as long as I live. Right? Isn't that how we do? 
You see how counterproductive complaining is? Let me give you some things. You ready? On how counterproductive it is. First, it steals your joy. It not only steals your joy, but it steals the joy of the one you're complaining to and about. It steals it. Don't. Here's another thing, number two. What is it, how, why is it counterproductive? Here's what it does. You ready? You ready? It, can, it, it weighs you down with ingratitude. Here's another thing, number three. It poisons our spirit. It poisons our spirit. And number next, it complaining and alienates others from us. Because nobody wants to be around somebody who complains all the time. If you're a chronic complainer, I want you to think about something for a minute. What has all your complaining ever accomplished? You may have gotten away with a few things, or gotten your way on a few things from time to time just to shut you up, being honest. But if you're totally honest with yourself, you'd have to admit you're complaining has brought you what? A lot more headaches than happiness and a lot more misery than satisfaction. Well, truth number one, complaining is a condemned sin. Number two, sorry, two, uh, complaining is a counterproductive sin. Number three, complaining is a contagious sin. Let's go on down uh, to verse 10. Let's start, let's start down in verse 10. Also in the day of gladness. Sorry, right, back up. Verse 10. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? And where, wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight, that thou hast laid the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldst say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, bearing the sucking, uh, beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swarest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. I am not able to bear all this people alone, because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand. If I have found favor in thy sight, and let me not see my wretchedness. Complaining is contagious. What started out as the complaints of a few people quickly spread like wildfire throughout the whole camp. And now the complaining bug has even hit Moses. Moses is so distraught by it, he says, God, just kill me. I can't deal with it anymore. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Friends, we shouldn't just complain. We need to take positive action to resolve the problem. Help resolve the issue. The problem with complainers is all they ever do is tell you what's wrong. They never tell you what they're going to do to help you make it right. <clears throat> they always tell you what's wrong, but never to help you do what's right. Let's be honest. Most of the complaining is selfish complaining that we have. It's piddly, nitpicky things that don't really matter today, nor will they matter in a hundred years. But we still complain about it. As Christians, we've got to exercise some extreme caution when we complain because complaining is a very contagious sin. It can spread through a whole church, a whole family, a whole workplace, and it'll ruin the sweet spirit and fellowship in all of those. It will. Anybody ever had a spouse complain about another spouse? You, you and you are complaining about each other. Do y'all feel like nuzzling up next to a warm fire on a cold winter's night? Does that promote fellowship and loving kindness? No. It, it promotes throwing of uh, frying pans and whatever else you can get your hands on, right? Complaining. You've ruined the spirit. Well, complaining is a condemned sin, 
It's a counterproductive sin. It's a contagious sin. Finally, here's it's a curable sin. It is curable. Now, one might think the way to cure ourselves of complaining would be simply stop complaining. Yeah, I'll just stop complaining. Yeah, just like I'll go on a diet and lose 100 pounds. They're both about as easy to do, aren't they? Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers, whatsoever, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is holy, right? Whatever is admirable, praiseworthy. Everything that is praiseworthy, think about such things. Friends, when you start thinking about all of those things, those complaining things go away, don't they? You have to train yourself to on purpose think of all those good things. I want you to remember God hears your complaints. Exodus 16, 7, Moses said, And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for He hears your complaints against the Lord. In the last part of, the, of that next verse, um, He says, For the Lord hears your complaints which you make against Him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Friends, you ever complained about somebody and then realized they just walked up behind you and heard every word you said? Pretty embarrassing, huh? I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is with us everywhere we go. I believe it is clear from God's Word that God doesn't like griping and complaining and fault-finding Christians. But the typical church gets filled with complaining Christians. We've got to be very careful when we begin to gripe about things at church. Are you griping about the preacher because he's not as friendly or he's not as good as you think he should be? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I am what I am. I'm Popeye. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> well, then you need to come share your complaints with me. So well, I would never do that. God's already heard your complaints. Might as well let the preacher hear him as well. It's more sermon material, amen? I want you to remember God hears your complaints. Repent of improper complaining. Do you know there's a right way to express what you see as a problem? And there's a right way to correct problems and seek solutions. But the problem is too many people whine and complain. They whine and complain because it's not like they Right? Now, I'm going to tell on mamas here for just a minute, okay? Now, mamas don't get mad at me, but I just happen to know this. When you ask a child to clean a room or clean something, okay, there's a reasonable expectation from said mother on how, how clean the room should be. When you go in to see that room, that room is not, well, mama clean. How many of you have ever been tempted or succumbed to the temptation of saying, this is not clean. You need to do more. And you say, Brother Don, why do you bring that up? Well, the reason I bring that up is, first, did you express the expectations of what Mama Clean really is? Second, did you at least praise them for the effort of trying to clean them, right? Right? Now, when you were a kid or I was a kid, what did we do? It was shoved in the closet, shoved under the bed. It was put anywhere. And, and my parents, the thing they said was, make sure I can see the floor. <laughs> that was pretty easy. Right? Shove it all out of the way. You can see it just fine. But then they got real picky and they said, well, it's not supposed to be all up under the bed. And I was a little smart aleck. I know it's hard to, hard to, hard to believe. <laughs> kind of my next thought was, I, never really, I don't think I ever really said it, because I'm still living. Is, um, but can you see the floor? <laughs> you are going to see the floor under the bed anyway. But you can see the floor. Or walk a path. I want to walk a path through your room. All right. By parting of the Red Sea. Right? And how we were as kids? Be careful. Be 
careful of complaining, okay? Rejoice in the small victories that your child actually did what you asked them to do. Amen? Repent of improper complaining. You know, some people say, well, I just believe and speak in my mind. Friend, everything in your mind does not have to go out of your mouth. Or onto Facebook. Everybody goes, Amen! Facebook. Oh, yeah. Right? Careful of your testimony on Facebook, friends. James chapter 3 always talks about bridling our tongues, so we need to repent of improper complaining. Next, put your faith in God. If unbelief is one of the causes of a complaining heart, faith in God is the cure. I just want to ask you a question. Is there anybody in this room that ever believed when you were growing up that even though there were issues in your home as far as maybe y'all had some money issues or maybe some things were going on, that your mom and dad were going to do their very best to take care of you? you believe that by faith, didn't you? Yeah. How many of us believe that when we call a pastor to a church, that pastor has your very best interest in mind? <clears throat> It may not be the best thing, but it's a thing. How many of y'all? How many of y'all believe that when a pastor is called to a church and the pastor says, "I'll take care of the church," you believe he'll do his best to take care of the church? How many of you believe now that when God who cannot lie says, "I'm going to take care of you," you believe that he will? And the whole central part of that is love. You see, he, your parents loved you. You loved your kids. You want to do everything you could for them. Your pastors love their churches and do whatever they can for them. But God loves you the most that He sent His Son Jesus to die for you. Provided salvation, He's going to provide everything you need until you meet Him again one day. And that leads me to this last point practice contentment. Clearly, contentment is the opposite of complaining. John the Baptist told the soldiers in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, that if they wanted to demonstrate they truly repented, they needed to be content with their wages. Philippians 4.11, and I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 8 keeps following, says, and having food and clothing with these we shall be content. And finally, Hebrews 13.5, I want you to see, we, we recognize that, that He'll never leave us nor forsake us, but read the rest of the verse. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For He Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. A content Christian is not a complaining Christian. Finally, practice thankfulness. I forgot I had one more point. We need to practice thankfulness. And whatsoever things we do, do, do all to the glory of God. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Practice thankfulness. And as far as negative talking is concerned, Paul tells us what to do in Philippians 4.4. 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Replace your chronic complaining with continuous praise. Let's see what happens. Matthew Henry was a famous Bible teacher. Anybody ever heard of Matthew Henry's commentary? Matthew Henry... Um, and uh, he was accosted and, and by thieves and he was robbed. And he wrote these words in his diary. This is his, his actual diary words. I am so very thankful. Okay? First, because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my purse, they did not take my life. Third, because although they took everything I had, it wasn't very much. Fourth, it was I who was robbed, not I who did the robbing. Instead of complaining about his trials, he was thankful. 
do everything without complaining or arguing. Let me help you. When you come home from work, leave your complaints at the door. You're not, you're not at work anymore. You, you, don't, you don't have to complain about work at home. You say, Brother Don, how am I going to get it all off my chest? Well, if it's a five-minute drive, make it a 15-minute drive, and you have a conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ and say, thank you for that job that I have so much frustration at. Amen? <laughs> Your family doesn't need more complaining. You walk in the church doors Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Leave your complaints at the door. God already knows them anyway. No sense in ruining the spirit of somebody else. At your workplace, before you walk in the door, leave your complaints at the door. Don't walk into your workplace already predetermined to complain about it. Because quite frankly, they could give you a piece of paper and says, here's some other places that you would probably be happy with working in. Or here's the, here's the number for the unemployment office. We'll see you later. Amen? So now the real question. How has this message impacted you and me? Now, there have been some funny points, and there have been some serious points. None of it matters unless we apply what we've learned. I, myself, am going to do a better job of not complaining. It's kind of, kind of interesting, you know. Um, sometimes you hear complain after complaint after complaint after complaint, don't you? And when you hear so many complaints, it causes you to want to complain, like, oh, whoa, huh? But I myself am going to commit to try to complain less. And be thankful more. Amen? What are some things I need to be thankful for? Very quickly, number one, your salvation. Be thankful that there was a God that loved you in spite of all your complaining. Number two, what should I be thankful for? If you're married today, your spouse. If you have kids, your family. Look around, friends. A family that stays together is, is a minority. Be thankful for what God's brought you. Be thankful for your job. But I don't make enough. Do you think God doesn't know that? Be thankful for your church. Be thankful God has given you a place to come and serve. Just be thankful. Amen. Mm -hmm.